Hello and welcome to the Lunaverse Virtual Planetarium from Lancaster University. The following is a recording of one of our free live public shows that we ran during early 2021. I hope you enjoy. So the month of April is pretty good when it comes to observing. However, some of the really nice uh, winter observations are starting to become a little bit harder. Uh, I was out last night, I was actually fun enough having a barbecue in the snow, but we'll ignore that. I was out last night having a look at some of the stars and on a clear night at the moment, you can certainly see quite a few things. So I'll speed up time here in the planetarium and take us to night time, which is lovely. Cool. All right. Da -da -da -da. Perfect. So one of the things that you'll certainly be able to see this month, uh, more than many of the other ones, uh, will be some of the great constellations. So Ursa Major is definitely easy to spot this time of year. All you have to do is look straight up. This is obviously for the Northern Hemisphere. Unfortunately, I can't do one for the Southern Hemisphere as well. Otherwise, we'd be here all day. But in the Northern Hemisphere, if you look straight ahead from any direction, straight up, you should be able to see Ursa Major right there in the centre or as many of us know at the plough or the Big Dipper, so with the three stars that form the tail of the bear and the four stars on the bear's barb forming the pot, that gives us Ursa Major, which is really good. If you go towards the other side, uh, sort of around, I don't know, 10 o'clock-ish, you could still see Orion. Orion is starting to fade away at this time of year. We only get it in the sort of early evening. So looking towards the southwest, the west at around 10 p.m., you should be able to see Orion and Orion's belt. That will dip below the horizon as the night goes on. So do make chance to uh, do take the opportunity to see it earlier in the daytime. You won't be able to see it later in the day. Mars is actually also similarly visible at this time of year as well. Mars is right there near Orion, just above uh, Taurus as well so if you want to see mars that is sort of in the the west southwest at around 10 o'clock as time does go on though uh it will dip below the horizon too so that is an early evening observation okay early evening observation for mars and orion likewise if i just take us around this is certainly more impromptu than normal but it's a uh, it's good fun uh there it is cassiopeia is also as per usual quite visible this time of year so towards the north and northwest uh, around the same sort of time, this is about 10 o'clock, as you should be able to see Cassiopeia fairly low in the sky. This is about the limit of how low a clear observation is going to be at this time of year. So definitely have the chance to see it. It may be blocked by a couple of houses, but 100% possible and worth watching. Longtime fans of uh, this lovely show here may know my favourite of all the constellations, and that's uh, Canis Venatici. Venacti, the semi different pronunciations that I've heard recently. That is actually really visible at the moment, and I did manage to spot it last night, which was super exciting. So if you look for Ursa Major, again, the plough straight up ahead, most nights long, you find the tail, you come to the very bottom of the tail, and then go across. So if the tail's on the left, you go to the right, you should see two stars in a line. The bottom one is much brighter than the top one. So you'll be able to see the bottom one quite easily. The top one's really faint, so you need to be in quite a dark area, but it's definitely possible. And that gives you Canis Venatici, an actine. Uh, and that is my favorite constellation because these two lines, uh, so these two dots and a line somehow represents two separate dogs. Your guess as to how that's possible is genuinely as good as mine. So that's a nice, easy one to spot at the moment. Fantastic. All right, we'll, we'll funnel through into the morning if I can actually speed up time properly here. Yeah, fantastic. And I go towards uh, sunrise, which would be over here. Yep, cool. We can also see some of the planets. Now, planet observations at this time of year get a little bit harder because we're losing some of the really nice uh, features that we've been seeing during winter. But there are some nice early morning observations of some of the planets. So if you are scary enough to get up early <laughs> and want to go look at the sunrise at this time of year and not freeze to death in the process, you can actually see both Jupiter and Saturn just before sunrise. So we're talking uh, mere minutes before it happening, sort of like 30, 40 minutes before sunrise. You can see both Jupiter and Saturn come across from the southeast. Again, northern hemisphere for all of this. Southeast, we have Jupiter here on the left, 
as Jupiter. And then we have Saturn here on the right, just above the horizon. Now, I must say that really is just above because as time moves on here and the sun rises, they will disappear as part of the sun rise. So we do lose it. However, those really early morning observations, we're talking sort of about 20 past five, half five-ish, you should be able to see them nice in the sky there. But soon afterwards, you actually get the moon come up and rise as well. So you get a nice moon rise with a sort of waning, I think it's the waning crescent at the moment, uh, just afterwards. So you have in a line Saturn, then followed by Jupiter, and then shortly afterwards, you have a new moon. Well, nearly new moon. So that's really quite nice. Finally, finally, one of the really exciting things to talk about uh, for this month, I'll speed up time once again here and bring us to the correct day, is the Lyriad, 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 meteor shower. So there's a big meteor shower. Sorry, I just need to click through. There we are. Cool. Uh, yep, we've got a big meteor shower on the way, which is very exciting. So the evening, the night of the 22nd into the tw sorry, 21st into the 22nd and the 22nd into the 23rd, we have the Lyriad meteor shower. It should roughly give you about 18 ish uh, meteorites per hour. That's the peak, apparently, 18 meteorites per hour. It's likely to be a lot less from the Northern Hemisphere in the UK, uh, just because of the position of them. So although you could potentially see that one, it's incredibly unlikely. Where can you see it from? Uh, the constellation of Lyria. So if you go towards the north, northeast and east sort of side, you look for Vega, it's this bright star at the tip of this diamond shape and in center here. That's where the meteor shower will take place. It technically peaks at uh, 2 p.m. on the 22nd, Obviously, that's not a particularly useful time. So again, 22nd, uh, 21st into 22nd, 23rd, uh, sorry, 21st, 22nd, 22nd into 23rd, those two evenings, they will be your peak. Probably going to get a couple of meteorites an hour. Make sure you wrap up nice and warm to do so. It is bitterly cold. Um, I can't tell you what the weather's going to be like for those two days. Unfortunately, it's a little too far away from this show to be with any certainty, but you should definitely be able to see some meteorites if you look around this constellation. Best not to use any binoculars, best not to use any telescopes. You want the biggest field of view you can get, so your eyes are really good for that. Lean back, look towards the stars, so your eyes adjust for about 20 minutes, get away from some streetlights, and you should be able to get your own meteor shower, which will be absolutely lovely. So there we go. So a couple of exciting things happening in this month. Not masses, but definitely a couple. So it's well worth uh, taking the opportunity to have a little look if you can. OK, fab stuff. With all of that out of the way, it's certainly time to move on to our full planetarium show. And as I said a little bit earlier on, today's show is going to be all about stellar evolution. It is easily one of my favourite topics, and it's one, funnily enough, that Dr John Stott actually taught me when I was an undergrad. So if I do it wrong, he'll certainly correct me a little bit later on. It'll also show how much I paid attention those years ago. So yeah, that's the show for today. And with enough button pushes here, we can get started. So stars, although they might look like really stable points in space, are anything but. They are massive balls of energy and plasma constantly trying to blow themselves apart. And a star's journey from death to birth, from birth to death is very violent and exceptionally varied. But lots of stars start their life in pretty much the same way originating from a very large cloud of gas, probably in a place fairly similar to the one we're having a look at now. So this is a nebula. A nebula, as I've mentioned a few times before, is the birthplace of many stars and is mostly just gas and dust. Parts of this cloud over millions of years can collapse under its own gravity and then eventually form stars. But to explain what's happening here, we've got to think about two key concepts gas pressure and gravitational forces. So first of all, gravity, like always, is trying to bring things with mass together. Any object that has mass has a gravitational pull. So basically anything that weighs anything, although weight in this context is really silly, but it's an easier thing to get your head around. Anything that has mass, substance, some matter to it, has some gravity. 
So every object that weighs anything has substance is currently attracting every other object towards it. So you are physically being pulled towards your computer screen and your computer screen is currently physically being pulled towards you because you're both objects with mass. Now, granted, the amount it's doing that is exceedingly small. In fact, your legs are stronger than the entire gravitational pull of the Earth, as is your neck, for instance, because it's able to withstand the pull of gravity and keep it upright. So gravity, although very common, is a very weak force pulling everything together. So bits of this cloud, in theory, would all get pulled together by gravity, bits of mass. But to try and counteract the gravity, we have pressure from gas. So the gas is going to be trying to resist being pushed together. A bit like, let's say you get a bottle of water with the cap still on, and you've ever tried to crush it, and you'll find out how exceedingly difficult that would be. Well, it's the same concept. You're trying to crush this thing, you're trying to compress the gas, and the gas is pushing back on you. Gravity is trying to compress the gas into a small space, and the gas is trying to push back against it. That's what's happening inside clouds like this. So for the most part, the pressure from the gas is probably going to win out over the gravity and not a huge amount is going to happen. But there is a critical point where the mass of the cloud is great enough that the gravitational force can overcome any gas pressure. We call this the genes mass. There's a couple of variations, genes radius and stuff. But the genes mass, basically the mass of an area of gas cloud, to bend it on a temperature that will allow it to collapse under its own mass. So eventually an area gets cool enough and dense enough that the gas can get pulled in and it will collapse until it forms a new equilibrium of pressure against gravity and forms what we call a protostar. So this is quite a dense ball of just gas. We're not a star yet, we're a protostar, we're like a pre-star, no fusion, we're just a sort of ball of vaguely warm gas just sitting there. It's pretty dense. And the nice thing about this, well, from stellar evolution point of view, if you've got this quite dense ball of mass, well, things with mass attract other things with mass. And the heavier you are, the more you attract things. So this fairly dense ball is going to be pulling more stuff in, which means it gets bigger, which means it then pulls more stuff in, which means it gets bigger, and then it pulls more stuff in. And it keeps going like that. So you eventually get this some kind of runaway effect where this thing keeps getting bigger and keeps drawing in more mass. Eventually, what's going to happen is that the gravitational force on the gas and the core is going to get more stronger and stronger. As it gets stronger, it's going to increase the temperature of the core. Eventually, the temperature will get high enough that hydrogen atoms will be able to collide at incredibly high speeds and then fuse with each other to form a helium atoms. And it's this fusion that powers all stars. So eventually hydrogen atoms, enough speed to overcome the repulsion between them, fuse together, make some helium, and there we go, we have fusion. An interesting side note is actually our sun technically isn't hot enough for fusion to actually happen. It's not hot enough to push the two hydrogen atoms together. Instead, quantum mechanics actually has to come in and lend a hand to allow the atoms to go under a process we call quantum tunneling, to basically skip the barrier and just whoop, go through to then fuse, which is really, really cool, but it's certainly a story for another time. A side, side, side note uh, is the fact that I'm going to use the term burn frequently throughout this show. And when I say burn, what I really mean is fuse. However, the term burning, burning hydrogen is quite common when talking about stellar evolution, and we really do mean fuse. Okay. The stars don't burn because they technically aren't combusting oxygen, but that's a technicality more than anything else. Cool. So once fusion does start, we get to be on the main sequence. So a star that is fusing pretty much after a little while goes to become what we call a main sequence star. And that is where our very beautiful sun currently is in its life cycle. For some time scales here of how long this takes for a star like our sun, it probably took roughly 50 million years for the sun to form and the sun has stayed on its main sequence for about 4.5 billion years so quite a long time but the main sequence doesn't actually last forever the main sequence of a star's lifetime is entirely dependent on how massive it is with bigger stars burning fuel faster than smaller stars because bigger stars are bigger and hotter 
and therefore can burn fuel quicker than the smaller stars can. So big stars burn quickly. Our sun is a fairly average kind of star, a little bit on the low end, but fairly average. And it has about five billion years left or so until it reaches the next stage of the life. When it does reach its next stage, it will have devastating consequences for anything that's left on the Earth after five billion years. So just before we move on, as a sort of reminder, there's currently um, a equilibrium here, an equilibrium here between the pressures being generated because of the fusion. So fusion generates a huge amount of energy uh, and that excites particles and that gives sort of a radiative uh, pressure that pushes up and gravity is pushing down against that. So there's a really good balance here between fusion pushing out and gravity pulling in. When that starts to break down is when things start to go a bit wrong for stars and they hit the name next point of their evolution. So the sun is currently fusing hydrogen into helium. So that's the lightest element into next lightest element. But there's an issue. It is not hot enough for the sun to fuse helium element uh, at atoms together to form the next one. So you end up with this core, there's a inert core where there is no fusion. There is no fusion in this core of helium. It's not hot enough to do so. So you basically just get this like solid core, which isn't doing a huge amount. It's not pushing outwards because it hasn't got any fusion, any radiation to do so. It's just being pulled inward because of gravity, which means the core starts to collapse a little bit, right? If there's, if there's less radiation going out and there's more pressure going in, well, it's gonna start to collapse. As it does start to collapse, it releases what we call gravitational potential energy, which causes the outer layers to expand. So the core starts to collapse because it's not burning as much and the outer layers start to expand. When it does, it becomes a red giant. And for scale, if one of these sort of more outlandish <laughs> uh, estimates of um, how large uh, our sun will get is two AU, so twice the distance between the sun and the earth that it currently is, a little bit large, but for scale, that's how large the sun could become when it hits its red giant stage. So that's when its core isn't fusing enough um, hydrogen together so that gravity is overrunning it, it's pushing the core together, the outer layers start to expand, and we have a look at something like this. It's pretty cool, it's pretty cool. So what happens here is hydrogen around this inert core is still fusing. So we've still got some hydrogen fusing and it's dumping helium into the centre. As it keeps dumping, the centre gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and denser and hotter and denser and hotter until eventually we get something called a core flash, where the entirety of the core suddenly starts being able to fuse together. Again, we've now reached such insanely high temperatures and pressures that it can just do it. In that second that it takes place, there is an energy output equivalent to the entire energy output of a galaxy in the matter of a few seconds. All of that goes into then re-expanding the core, bring it back up again and allowing the outer layers to shrink back down again, which is pretty cool. To explain this better, I've got this little, uh, yeah, that's better, little image here to help us sort of show it. So we have our sun, and inside of it, you have this hydrogen burning shell. So there's this shell of hydrogen that is still burning and that's just dumping helium down. That helium core isn't doing anything, but that hydrogen shell keeps burning, keeps dumping, gets hotter, keeps dumping, gets hotter until eventually it explodes, which is really cool. So it burns quite briefly, everything expands, but everything expands and then it can't, it's not hot enough to fuse the helium anymore. So it then starts to contract again until eventually it contracts deep enough and gets hot enough again to explode and go back out and then it contracts again and then it explodes it goes back out and then it contracts again then it explodes again, and this keeps happening and as this continues essentially you get this um process really of expanding contracting expanding contracting that causes very large solar winds so essentially big space files as things go up and down up and down up and down and this forms what we call a planetary nebula which looks a little bit like this so this is what happens when the outer layers all get blasted off in these large solar winds because of this big contraction and, and uh, expansion over and over again, and you end up with these beautiful, beautiful planetary nebulas. Thank you, NASA, for these lovely images. Pretty cool. At the centre of these planetary nebulae, 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 many words, uh, we have what we call white dwarfs. 
white dwarf stars, which are typically made of carbon and oxygen. That's really what's left over from this process here. And these are really dense objects. A cube, a centimeter, a centimeter cube uh, would weigh about a ton, so a thousand kilograms. So a little, basically a sugar cube would weigh about a thousand kilograms, which is insane. They're pretty small objects as well. So coming in around the size of the earth or a bit bigger. So imagine that you've got, you got something as essentially as heavy as the sun being roughly compressed into the size of the earth. It's quite a remarkable thing. What's really amazing is the only thing that holds these stars together is another piece of quantum mechanics. There's a principle called the Pauli exclusion principle, which basically states that two electrons with the same properties cannot exist at the same point in space. So you've got two fairly identical electrons. They can't exist in the same point. Electrons in a white dwarf are actually pushed so close together that we call them electron degenerate, meaning the only pressure pushing it back against gravity is the fact that quantum mechanics says they can't exist in the same place. How crazy is that? This quantum mechanics principle is the only reason why these stars don't collapse. Amazing. White dwarfs are very dim objects. They're no longer fusing atoms together to generate heat and light. The light only comes from stored thermal energy that's slowly radiating away. And this transfer is massively slow and inefficient. In fact, the universe isn't actually old enough that a white dwarf could have yet radiated all of its energy away and become what we call a black dwarf. So white dwarfs would probably be last, some of the last structures ever left in the universe as they just very slowly cool down. That's pretty cool. Stars that are slightly bigger than the Earth, actually fair, quite a lot bigger than the Sun, sorry, uh, have a very different life cycle. After the main sequence, they will become red supergiants, which is similar to a red giant, just, well, super. Thing, and things work a little bit differently here. Now, these are stars that end up being so large that they would engulf Saturn. The one we're looking at here, I always call it Betelgeuse, and I know it's not called Betelgeuse. A lot of people call it Betelgeuse. It's also not called Betelgeuse. It's uh, uh, Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse, whichever one you prefer. I'm just going to keep calling it Betelgeuse because I prefer it, even though I'm flipping two of the letters around. Um, to give you a sort of sense of scale how big a red supergiant is, I put together this quick little animation for you. So here's our sun. Hello, Mr. Sun. Uh, and then here is Betelgeuse. Yeah, maybe if I just zoom out a little bit, it might be a little bit easier to see. Yeah, it's a fairly, it's a, it's a fairly big star. It's a fairly big star. Just to re reiterate, the Earth in comparison to the Sun in this scale would just be like a dot. Just be a dot. So really, really large objects. It's good fun putting animation together. I love that. So yeah, Beltese, Beetlejuice, Beetle guys. Uh, very, very large supergiant. Now, the difference here in a red supergiant is actually it's big enough and hot enough for a helium core to burn. So at the end of the hydrogen burning time, you actually can get a helium burning section, which is really cool. And then you can also get a carbon burning section to so the next step, uh, stage. So you get the layers above dumping to the next one, eventually gets hot enough to burn and it starts fusing into the next element. And then that makes layers that then start going on to the next one. And to show that, I've also got another image. So essentially you end up with like an onion style star where each layer allows the next layer of heavier elements to start fusing. So you get hydrogen to helium, then you get helium eventually goes into carbon, and then you get carbon goes into neon, and that takes a neon core, takes a couple of centuries. Then that neon core will turn into an oxygen core, which takes about a year, then a silicon core, which takes about a month to happen. And then eventually that becomes an iron core, which takes about a day to burn into. So each layer allows the next layer to fuse. The problem is when we get to iron, because iron doesn't release energy, it actually takes energy away to fuse it. So it's basically dead weight and pretty useless. So you're making all these different layers and you're still expanding, you're still getting energy coming out of it from the fusion, except from iron, where actually fission would become more efficient at this point, which is what reactors on the, on the Earth do. So fusion taking place here would be useless and you lose energy. So you actually have an inert core again, that inert iron core, it's electron degenerate. Eventually, because of, of course, each layer is still burning and dumping stuff onto the next layer, which is burning and dumping stuff onto the next layer, just like from before, 
you get this really dense core, eventually it gets hot enough and dense enough that it can collapse. Uh, the electron degeneracy, so this thing that's keeping it above, just like the white dwarf, collapses, it breaks, it stops working, and it falls into itself. It falls into itself faster than light. So you've got this big iron core, collapses faster than light. Eventually it becomes what we would call neutron degenerate, where all the protons, positive charged things, are turned into neutrons. They then basically stop collapsing because neutron degeneracy takes over. So you've got this iron core, collapses very, very quickly and then stops even faster into this little, little tiny neutron core. All the other layers now have space to move. So you've just had the thing holding you up disappear. Well, then you're going to start falling as well. So the layers start going down in free fall. So you have this core, which is collapsed. Then the silicon layer is going to collapse and then hit the core and bounce off it. The oxygen layer is going to come down and then bounce off that silicon core. Then the neon core is going to bounce off. Then the carbon core is going to bounce off. Then the helium core is going to bounce off. Then hydrogen is going to bounce off. And it's this collapse and bounce off effect that causes a supernova. And a supernova is one of the most impressive things in the universe. If you think of numbers and scales, I can promise you a supernova beats all of them. Here's a fun question for the audience. You can't directly answer it, but it's just a little thought experiment. Which one do you think is brighter? A hydrogen bomb going off in your eyeball or a supernova going off at the distance of where the sun is? Which one do you think is brighter? Going by my tone, you can probably guess it's going to be the hydrogen bomb. By nine orders of magnitude, it is brighter. The supernova, as in the supernova is brighter than the hydrogen bomb by nine orders of magnitude. To clarify, that's not nine times bigger, that's a billion times bigger, roughly. So you've got a supernova, this huge, insane explosion that is equaling the entire output of a galaxy going off. In doing so, you then get heats and temperatures and pressures high enough to actually fuse all of the heaviest elements in the universe past iron. So that's how we have elements heavier than iron on Earth through supernovae. Supernova explosions allow that to take place, which is pretty, pretty cool. Left behind this huge explosion is a tiny, tiny star, even more dense than a white dwarf, which we would call a neutron star. And these tiny stars are some of the densest objects in the universe. A single teaspoon of a neutron star would weigh a billion tons. Neutron stars are only about 13 miles across, which is roughly the size of central London. So think Kew Gardens to Stratford for people who live around there. But imagine that, a star much heavier than our sun. So go, beetle girls, beetle guys, Belgians, uh, earlier, condensed into a size around this, around sort of London or so. Absolutely insane. Neutron stars also have some incredibly strange properties. A lot of them can spin really fast. So a conservation of angular momentum means they end up spinning really fast. Some around like 700 times a second. And they actually shoot jets of radiation, jets of radiation from the poles, which then just sort of shoot out. And as they spin, it acts a bit like a lighthouse where the jets can sometimes pass into the basically point towards the Earth. And that's one of the ways that we can detect them. We call them pulsars when their jets pass pulse between us, which is really cool. A side note here, uh, when protons turn to neutrons via electron capture in the process where that the iron core collapses and becomes neutron degenerate, they actually produce a large number of what we call neutrinos. And neutrinos are fundamental particles that don't really like to interact with anything. They're everywhere, but they just don't do a lot. In fact, you actually have roughly a billion neutrinos currently passing through your thumb. Which is a really weird thought. You actually have a hundred trillion passing through your whole body, but you'll only actually interact with one of them every couple of years or so. So a hundred trillion every second, and you'll only interact with one maybe every couple of years. What's really cool is that during a supernova, an impossibly large number of neutrinos are made so much in such a quick session that we can actually detect it here on Earth. There was a detection in 1987 SN1987A, where they actually found the supernova, supernova, three hours before it was visible because of a neutrino detector was recently switched on. And they saw this little burst and they realized that it must have come from a, a supernova. And later they realized the light from the supernova came later. And that's because 
if a neutrino doesn't really interact with anything, it can just go past space dust, it can leave the core a lot quicker, unlike, say, light, which does bounce off things and takes a little bit longer to get here because of the scattering. As such, if you then have a neutrino detection, a big neutrino detection, you could actually use that as an early warning system of, hey, there might be a large supernova coming. And then you can point telescopes towards it and then have a look at the supernova unfold a few hours later. So there actually is a project called SNOOZ, Supernovae Early Warning System, I believe is the acronym, you might have gone that wrong, uh, which is designed to try and spot supernovae before they happen. Sadly, there hasn't been a single detection of one since 1987. I'm sure that could be corrected if I'm wrong, but I'm fairly confident there hasn't been one since. So although a great idea hasn't come to full fruition anyway. There are also different types of supernovae. They don't just have to come from red giants, red supergiants, sorry. You can also get them from what we call supernovae 1A, which are white, like again, correct me if I'm definitely wrong here, but white dwarfs that then get, have a binary star. So there's another star with them. Some of the matter can then get pulled off that one, then making the uh, white dwarf heavier and heavier. Eventually the white dwarf gets too heavy and will explode into a supernova because essentially the same thing that was happening, that, that solid core gets too heavy, collapses, becomes neutron generate and explodes. That can happen as well, but with supernova 1A, they happen at the exact same point every time, meaning they're always going to give the same amount of light and we can use that as a standard candle essentially in the universe to help us figure out how far away things are by looking at how their light changes over time. It's really, really cool. So a neutron star uh, is the densest thing in the universe, except from just one more thing, which is a black hole. So the only thing that can be a neutron star in density is a black hole. And the only way a black hole can come about, well, there are a few ways, but the main way a black hole can come about is if a neutron star collapses. So if neutron degeneracy pressure is broken, if there's enough mass for that to collapse, then you form a black hole where not even light can escape, which is absolutely amazing. This is not obtaining a black hole, this is the Andromeda galaxy, but there is a massive black hole at the centre, so it's the best I can do for you all. And there we go. That is an incredibly quick whistle-stop tour from a star's birth to a star's death in the two main branches of red giants and red supergiants. I apologise for how fast that was, there was a lot to get over in quite a short space of time, but I do hope that you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about how they work and some of the really cool properties of them. But now it is time to chat to John, who is here, to talk all about uh, these fantastic processes, the stellar evolution, uh, and understand a little bit more about them. So John, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm John Stott. I'm a lecturer in, uh, in um, astrophysics at Lancaster University. Um, so I taught Andrew uh, everything he knows about stars. And um, I do my own research, uh, but that's mainly into galaxies rather than stars, um, looking at galaxies right back in, in the distant universe and how they evolve to become galaxies like our own Milky Way over billions of years. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. So um, one of the first questions I'm going to ask you here, John, uh, uh -huh. what is what is the minimum and maximum mass of a star? So what sort of the, the min maxes we can have uh, yeah. between the stars? So the maximum, um, you were talking a number between probably 100 and 200 times the mass of the sun. Um, and the reason why it can't get any more massive than that is that um, as you're, you're forming your star, as your materials coming together, uh, you also have a lot of radiation coming out of the star and these massive stars are very bright. Um, and uh, particularly bright in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, and that can push material away. So you have a maximum limit of something like 100 to 200 uh, times the mass of the sun as the maximum mass of a star. Uh, there's an idea that um, depending on the chemical composition, this could be different. And um, so the very first stars that were formed, uh, they uh, only contain basically hydrogen and helium, and they could be even more massive. They could even be 300 uh, times the mass of the sun. But so it's sort of in the in the numbers of a hundreds. Um, but the way the way stars are formed means that uh, very massive stars are very rare. So um, you have very few uh, stars that are above 20, 30 solar masses. Uh, but you have lots of stars that are around the mass of the sun or around about half the mass of the sun. 
Brilliant. Um, and then the what was it, minimum mass as well? Yeah, so what's, what's the sort of smallest that a star could be? Well, then it, you go into the definition of what a star is. So mm -hmm. if we say that a star is something that can fuse hydrogen in its core, um, so, you know, sort of it's, 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 it's powered by fusion is a star rather than a planet like Jupiter, which isn't. So Jupiter is obviously a big ball of gas, but it doesn't have nuclear fusion going on in its core. So we're somewhere between the sun and Jupiter at, at, at that sort of stage. And what we find is, I think the smallest mass star is something like a tenth of the mass of the sun. Mm. Um, and you can still generate enough heat and pressure in the center to fuse hydrogen. And then I think in terms of what that is compared to the mass of Jupiter, it's something like 100 times the mass of Jupiter. Um, and so you, you're, you're somewhere between, you know, it's sort of a, t a tenth the mass of the sun, or well, that's about 100 times the mass of Jupiter. And below that, you don't have the, uh, you don't have the, um, the, the pressure and the temperature to, to fuse hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Are mass and size inextricably linked? Ooh, well, um, <laughs> yes and no. Um, and so you've got a uh, star like our sun, as you showed, it evolves such that when it's when it's burning hydrogen in its core, um, it has this, the size it has now, but it can expand um, to tens of times larger as it as it uh, evolves, uh, but it still has the same mass. And so this is when you were talking about red giants, of course, um, the, the core of the star contracts and the envelope expands and cools, so it becomes cool and red. Now, um, red stars are, are, are cold and, uh, and blue stars are hot. So um, as, as it expands, it cools and um, becomes la larger in extent, but it isn't any more massive. So the sun isn't more massive when it becomes a red giant, it's just uh, larger. So its density drops, it becomes more, uh, um, more lower density, basically. But yes, so, but then Having said that, the sort of red, the red giant equivalent of um, super giant stars, so the um, the very massive stars in the universe, uh, they're even bigger. So you will have uh, stars that are, you know, uh, 20, 30 uh, times the mass of the sun. And then when they go into their red giant phase, they're even bigger than the sun in its red giant phase. Brilliant. As you showed, you know, uh, stars, you know, like, uh, going out to the size of, the radius of uh, of uh, radius of the orbit of Ju of Jupiter or, or of Saturn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. There, there's some really cool ways you can actually play with that. And if you ever get a chance to, you know, have a look at some of the scales, it's, it's insane just how big they can be. It's really yeah. cool to put some of those together. It's mind blowing. Um, a great question here from the audience. Um, can planets still orbit neutron stars? And if so, could they possibly support life? Uh, yeah, yeah, a planet, a planet can definitely um, orbit a neutron star. I mean, I suppose it um, depends what happens when the star goes supernova because, mm. you know, your neutron star is obviously what's left over after a supernova. But if your planet's survived that explosion, um, presumably any life on those planets would um, would not have survived the supernova explosion. But But if then... The neutron star is there and it has a planet orbit and around it um, that eventually you know could potentially restart life uh, the way it would work would be that uh, i think you mentioned um pulsars as well and um neutron stars themselves obviously give off radiation but they also have this this pulsation of radiation as well due to how they rotate um and uh, and release radiation and so in that case um the radiation from that star would be generally quite high energy radiation like x-rays and ultraviolet and so that would be uh, bad news for any life on those planets but if the planets had a very thick atmosphere or something perhaps um, they could convert the the x-rays into heat or something if it had a very thick atmosphere and that's potentially uh, a way of getting heat energy down to the surface of the planet that could be used by some strange form of life that we're not we're not aware of. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. There's a, it's actually, I don't know if you may have seen it, John, there's a really great thing from XKCD a little while mm -hmm. back about um, what, could the neutrinos from a supernova kill you? Because of course, neutrinos are so weakly interacting. As I mentioned earlier, there's 100 trillion passing through you right now. They're not doing anything. They're technically no. radiation, but they're not doing anything. They're never going to do anything. Could the uh, neutrinos from a supernova kill you? And the answer is, well, yes, if you get close enough. 
you actually only need to be 2.3 AU away for right. the neutrino radiation to actually just kill you. So that's, for, for reference, it's just a bit further away from than Mars is. So if you get right. get Mars, is about 1.5, I think. So a little bit further than Mars would actually kill you. Now, naturally, um, you'd actually be inside the supergiant star before yes. that happens. It's going to be much bigger than, than 2 AU to become a, uh, become a neutron star. But <laughs> even though that yeah. would definitely kill you first, even after all of that vaporized you and turned you into plasma and you didn't exist anymore, the neutrinos would kill you. Which I think so is really if, interesting. So if you anything that was sort of near suit. that supernova is very dead. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which I love it. Really cool. Really cool little That's fact. Great. So if, yeah, if you had a radiation suit on that protect you from the gamma rays or something or the you know yeah. the explosion, still um, <laughs> the neutrinos would get you. Yeah. Okay. I, I was not aware of that. Yeah. It's it's a really cool. Th I, I recommend. Uh, I might see if I make an announcement that everyone can see. It. It's a lovely. It's actually from his book. Uh, uh, what if? And. Uh, it's basically what if you were close enough to a supernova that the neutrinos could kill you. It's really cool. Really cool to <laughs> the maths. Uh, fam. So another great question here. Uh, before neutron stars are detected, can you know when to expect a supernova? Ooh, that's good. Ooh. Well, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, how do you expect a supernova? That's a very good question. Um, that sort of end of the star's life is pretty rapid, as you as you sort of showed. You know, the, the sort of fusion to the iron core is you know takes place over a day or so. So um, it's hard to predict because you can't see what's going on inside the star. Um, it would be the case that you would probably see um, it'd be a, if it's a core collapse supernova, is the one you described that goes to to a neutron star or a black hole, then um, you would potentially see uh, lots of variability from that star so it may suddenly get very very bright or suddenly get very very faint or something as 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 uh, as the atmosphere of that star is changing as as the processes inside are, are changing rapidly so you may get some clue from that um and there are some stars that vary very rapidly uh, are very uh, very rapidly in their brightness uh intercarini for example has been varying um over uh, over yeah basically in flux by a factor of a thousand over the last few hundred years so and that's a candidate for something that may go supernova at some point uh, and even the last year uh, betelgeuse changed in its brightness significantly uh that uh, but people were slightly worried that it might go supernova but it turned out that wasn't the case it was uh, it was some cool gas leaving its surface but um but but yeah, you may get a clue from something like that. But as it's rapid, it's difficult to know. And so the problem is we tend to look at stars uh, that look like they're about to go supernova in astronomy terms. But what we really mean is they'll go supernova at some point in the next few million years. So that's sort of the uh, the kind of, ne you know, what's going to happen next is in the, almost the next minute is really what we mean in a few million years. Yeah, it's a very long time scale <laughs> to yeah. start your observations, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Oh, bless you all. Um, fab, that was really great. Cheers for that. Uh, what are the differences between the formation of a planet and the formation of a star? Ah, OK. Great um, well, they, I mean, they, they're sort of linked. So uh, you yeah, have a cloud of gas uh, and this cloud of gas will have some rotation to it. And uh, as it gets denser and things move towards the center, what tends to happen is instead of being a staying as a ball, because there's rotation, it's energetically favorable for it to collapse down into a disk. So it becomes a disk with uh, which is getting denser at the center because um, in that disk of material, in that gas and dust that you've got there, that you've collapsed down from your, your sort of nebula cloud, and you've got friction and that's forcing things to move towards the center because they're losing angular momentum because of the friction. And so um, the amount of material that's forming at the center, that's where the star is going to form. But then out in the disk, you'll probably get um, regions that are more or less dense than other regions, and they'll start to co coagulate more into sort of smaller, maybe not full size planets, but smaller um, things at various orbits that then will knock into each other and then build up again to make um, planet sized objects around this star. So they kind of form at the same time. You're, you're forming a star and its planetary system at uh, the same time through basically the same process. It's, uh, it's gravity bringing things together. Yeah, that's brilliant. No, thank you for that one. That's fantastic. So we sort of we sort of touched on it a little bit already, but mm -hmm. what would happen if a supernova blew up near Earth? 
Well, I, I guess, <laughs> I, I, so I don't know the answer to, just offhand, I don't know the answer to the question, how close could one be mm. and we'd be okay. Mm. Um, the most recent one that happened um, that was close to the Earth was was Supernova 1987A. Yeah. And that was one that was detected in, in neutrinos, for example. But that didn't happen in our galaxy. That happened in the galaxy next door. Now, there's a very small, well, there's a, its name makes it sound like it's quite large, but it's not really. The Large Magellanic Cloud is a small galaxy that lives next door to the Milky Way. And, uh, and that, um, that went off um, in 1987. And so there was no effect on, on Earth from that, except we saw you know, bright light and we also saw, uh, we also saw the, the uh, neutrinos that were detected from that. Um, if one went, one, one went supernova within a distance that could be something to worry about, then um, you would get, you know, you get a strong flux of, uh, of X-rays and gamma rays, and these things are obviously bad, um, bad for life on Earth. It would have to be, a, there, there are no candidate stars nearby that are, that are massive that could cause any trouble to the Milky Way, that could cause any trouble, sorry, to the, to the solar system. Um, and so we're safe, definitely. But um, but if there was one nearby, you get a massive flux of gamma rays, massive flux of X rays, and it would depend then whether our uh, our atmosphere uh, could cope with that. And as well, uh, you know, depending on how close it was, and as well, you'd probably get a massive flux of um, what's called cosmic rays that are really high energy uh, charged particles like protons and electrons. And they can do a lot of damage, but we're we're protected by our uh, magnetic field on Earth, uh, and so um, it, we, again, it would need to be a large flux of those. But if, if that did happen, of course, then it, you could end up removing the atmosphere with the with the gamma rays and the X rays. So it'd be it'd be a bad day to be on Earth, I think. C certainly would be. Certainly would be. I refer us all back to the nuclear bomb in the eye. <laughs> Still weaker. A billion times weaker. How is that a billion times weaker? <laughs> Hydrogen bomb in your eye, not as bright as a supernova going off. It's insane. It's insane. Fab. Cheers, John. Uh, sort of linked to what you asked talking about earlier about the the planet formation was pretty good. Uh, why do you, I I could answer this, but I hate talking about this. Uh, why do planets tend to orbit stars in a plane? So why are they all sort of in the same sort of plane? Why aren't they just going around like that? Why aren't some going backwards? Why do they all tend to orbit in the same way? Uh, yeah, it's just it's just purely um, because if they've if they've got some angular momentum, so if this cloud of gas is rotating at the start, then it will tend to collapse into a disk that is uh, in that plane of rotation. So you'll you'll continue like that, and that's just because that's an energetically more favourable state. You're, you're you've got gravity above and below pulling things in towards the centre of it, and you're rotating here. So you're holding you you've got angular momentum in this uh, plane, so that's holding you in the orbit. Uh, so you're not going to uh, zoom in towards the centre except uh, by uh, friction, um, but you've got, uh, but here your gravity is pulling you in towards the centre of the disk. Brilliant. No, that's fantastic. It's a much better answer than I was trying to try and give before. No, that's brilliant. Cheers, John. Uh, we're sort of wrapping up towards the end uh, of our time here, which is a shame, but we'll probably just a quick little question here and then we'll probably call it there. So just a quick answer from some, a uh, quick question from somebody was, will uh, Beltegese, Beetlejuice, Beetle guys, whatever you like, uh, go supernovae in our supernova, sorry, in our lifetimes, and sort of maybe link to that following on. Um, do you think there's going to be another supernova in our lifetime? Uh, so yeah, um, I'm I'm a I'm a Beetlejuice person, but I appreciate I am also pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, yeah. Oh, as I say, we don't know. I mean, it could go off any moment. But as I said before, any moment means any time in the next million, two million years. So it's difficult to know, you know, so it could go off tomorrow, it could go off in two million years time. And, and uh, you know, astronomically speaking, that's basically the same thing, just because we deal with these sort of timescales. Uh, it's, uh, it's very strange because the universe is billions of years old. We think of things happening soon as in happening in a million years time or something. So uh, it's difficult to give a prediction as I said we don't really know what's going on exactly what's going on inside the star there's lots of studies of Jupiter oh not Jupiter sorry of Betelgeuse um so we can you know we've got lots of data from it um and it's one of the few stars we can study the surface of very well because it's so big um but but at the moment it's hard to make an accurate prediction as to when it will go off but yeah it could well go off in our lifetime 
Uh, was what was the other? Uh, do you question? believe there's going to be a supernova in our lifetime? Supernova. Yeah. Right. I'm going to try and remember now if I get this right. So I think a galaxy like the Milky Way. Uh, I think you expect to see a um, a supernova go off in it on a time scale of maybe I think oh, I, I cannot remember maybe something like once every hundred years or so. Mm. So it's certainly plausible that it could happen within our lifetime. Um, the problem is is that um, the Milky Way's got a lot of dust in the middle of it, so we only really see the bit of the Milky Way that we are uh, that we're in. You know, we don't see a huge amount of the Milky Way from where we are. Uh, so it might not be, you know, if it's on the other side of the galaxy, it goes off. We wouldn't see it because of the amount of dust in the way. It's my chance to say thank you to the fantastic people from Lancaster University who gave up some of their time off to be here today. So a massive thank you, first of all, to John, who was here to answer your fantastic questions. So a big thank you to John. Give a little wave to John. Hey, we go. Uh, thank you so much, mate. That was really, really fantastic. Uh, a big thank you to Josh, who has been behind the scenes, answering your questions, giving some private replies and sorting all that out. And to our executive producer, <laughs> George, who was handling uh, a lot of the stuff behind the scenes and telling me off when I, he couldn't hear me, which is great. Thank you for watching. And I hope you enjoyed learning a little more about our amazing universe. Our team from Lancaster University also runs shows for schools, community groups and more, both in person with our portable inflatable planetarium and online. But any in-person events are subject to current COVID restrictions. If you're a teacher, community group leader or part of a similar educational organisation, please do get in touch. We're particularly keen to make connections with those in our region of Lancashire and Cumbria, but we'd love to hear from you wherever you are. But for now, take care and keep learning more about the amazing wonders of our night sky. Thank you.